Hello, and welcome to our first invited talk session. Um, our speaker today is Kunle Olukutun, who is the Cadence Design Professor of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science at Stanford University. Um, he's a renowned professor in multi-core processor design and the leader of the Stanford Hydra Multiprocessor Chip Project. Um, he currently works at Samba Nova Systems, but you may know him um, from Afara Web Systems, which he founded, and the, the multi-core processor they designed there is now used or was used in Oracle's and Sun's Spark-based web servers. He's an ACM fellow, an, ICM, an IEEE fellow, and a member of the National Academy of Engineering. So uh, if you have questions during the talk, um, the Sledo link was up before. Um, it may appear again. And um, please ask questions through Sledo. And I'm going to turn it over to uh, Dr. Lukatun. So thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Todd, for that uh, generous welcome. And uh, thank you for the organ to the organizers of uh, Supercomputing 21 for inviting me to talk. And it's glad to be here in person after so long. This is my first uh, in-person presentation. So the title of my talk today is Let the Data Flow. And I'll talk about uh, some of the work that we've been doing at Stanford and at Samanova Systems to develop new platforms for uh, accelerating uh, ML and AI applications. As you all know, AI is transforming the world. It's being used to uh, do very uh, high-end applications like natural language processing. It's being used to do medical imaging. It's transforming the world of robotics and making that uh, more intelligent. And it's uh, having a dramatic effect in AI for science, uh, in accelerating uh, and advancing scientific research by training models based on data. Right, so this whole transformation of AI is based on, instead of developing algorithms uh, typically that we do manually, which is people have called this software 1.0, software 2.0 is the idea of building models uh, based on data and then using those models uh, to, uh, uh, to transform the way that we do uh, uh, ap application and software development. And so the question is, how can we accelerate this AI transformation by developing new platforms that uh, accelerate the performance and capabilities of uh, the models that we build. And uh, we need to do this in the context of Moore's law slowdown and the fact that all computing is fundamentally power and energy constrained, right? And so any improvements that we make have to improve performance per watt, not just performance. And so <clears throat> the question is sort of how do we do this uh, you, know, in the, you know, you could go build an ASIC, but an ASIC, of course, would not be flexible. So the question is sort of how can you get ASIC level efficiencies and performance while, you know, maintaining the processor-like flexibility that we've all become accustomed to? And so the key way that, that uh, we have developed uh, for doing this is the idea of data flow computing. And this is based fundamentally on understanding the trends and the directions of machine learning algorithms and developing customized hardware and software that exploit uh, these characteristics to get very efficient and flexible computation. And so I'm going to describe you know, the, the uh, uh, hardware and, and software that we've been developing at Sambanova, and also show you some of the, describe some of the applications of data flow computing and how it's transforming the way that we are uh, building AI and ML systems. So let me start with ML algorithms. So as you all know, the key thing with, with uh, ML algorithms is the exponential growth of the neural networks that are being used to uh, develop you know, ever more accurate models. So the complexity of the models is, is growing. The amount of data used to train uh, these models is, is growing. And a really good example of this trend is the large natural language models uh, that are being developed over time. And if you look at the uh, growth uh, of, the si uh, of the size of these models, they're basically doubling every two and a half months. And so we are at the point now that we have got multi-trillion -tr uh, parameter models, and they uh, have multi-terabytes of data required to hold these parameters, and you know, petabytes of data are being used to actually train uh, 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 the these models. And a good example of this is uh, the GPT-3 uh, model, uh, the gener generative pre-trained transformer uh, developed uh, by OpenAI. It's got 175 billion parameters. 
Uh, it takes uh, about 1,000 uh, uh, GPUs and four months to train. And of course, at this uh, uh, exponential uh, rate increase of, of two and a half, uh, doubling every two and a half months, this is unsustainable. So clearly we need to be more intelligent about how we uh, build these models. And so the key idea that's being developed uh, for uh, containing both the complexity and the computing uh, uh, requirements of these models is to, to do what is called sparse training, right? So traditionally, most of the training of these models has been using dense uh, matrix multiply. Uh, and then now people are starting to look at sparse models. And so there's key uh, research showing that, hey, if you have a, 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 a network that you can replace it with a, a sparse network that has the same uh, accuracy, this so-called lottery ticket hypothesis. But the question is sort of how do you find that network and how do you find it in a sparse way? So this is the uh, topic or the subject of sparse training. And uh, people have looked at doing sparse training, but if you look at uh, unconstrained uh, sparsity, what you'll get is a model that you can't train very efficiently with hardware. Or you'll find out that, that the accuracy of the model isn't uh, as good at, at, as the dense model. So the, the key challenge then is how can we do this sparse training while maintaining accuracy and hardware efficiency? And some key research at Stanford that recently has been done is this whole idea of the pixelated butterfly structured sparsity algorithm. And this algorithm is both efficient, it uh, gets very high accuracy, and it's very amenable to uh, acceleration with the right kind of hardware. And the right kind of hardware is hardware that has uh, support for structured sparsity. Another trend that's uh, important in machine learning algorithms is the convergence of training and inference. So traditionally, what uh, happens is that training is done with large batches, and it's typically done on a GPU, which is efficient uh, for large batch training. And then the models are created and then refined uh, somewhat and, and actually served you know, using uh, CPUs because CPUs are much more efficient on batch one uh, inference. And so with the convergence, the idea is that you could train uh, your large batch using large batch uh, batches uh, and then serve the same model that you train. And this would give you two big benefits. One, you wouldn't have to recertify uh, and requalify the model on, on your uh, inference platform. And you could do incremental re re retraining or even continuous training. And some of these models that, that can adapt to shifts in the distribution of data require continuous uh, training. And so this advantage uh, is, is something that you would get if you had a converged uh, platform that was efficient at doing training and inference. At the end, <clears throat> if you look at the way that the ML algorithms are developed, of course, they're developed using uh, these frameworks uh, like TensorFlow and uh, PyTorch. And one of the benefits of using these frameworks, of course, is, is that you uh, dramatically increase the productivity of the uh, data, uh, data scientists and, and ML uh, algorithm developers. Uh, and uh, you know, Google has shown that you can, you can tr shrink uh, the code uh, used to do uh, translation from 500,000 lines of imperative C++ to 500 lines of data flow code expressed as TensorFlow. So fundamentally then, uh, uh, machine learning algorithms are data flow. And some of the, the uh, we've, we've been doing a lot of work in the area of domain-specific languages at Stanford uh, you know, over the last 10 years. And one of the things that we uh, <coughs> uh, concluded was that you could describe a lot of these uh, domain-specific languages uh, in terms of parallel patterns. And these are functional uh, uh, data uh, transformations on, uh, on collections of data like uh, arrays, uh, tables, uh, uh, and, and tensors. And some uh, patterns which you are probably familiar with are like map, uh, zip, uh, reduce, and others uh, like flat map and group by. And the idea is that you can take uh, uh, graphs that you come out of uh, your machine learning uh, uh, environment, uh, like PyTorch and, and TensorFlow, and you can analyze these graphs and translate them into uh, 
graphs of parallel patterns. And these parallel patterns are, in fact, hierarchical. And so you've got, uh, a, 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 as you see in the uh, uh, picture, uh, you've got map. And, and uh, this could be internal to the map it, it is a reduced. So you've got these hierarchical parallel patterns. And what you've get, got is, is data flow uh, representation at the parallel pattern level, which is much more generic and can support both uh, machine learning and data processing, like SQL. And SQL uh, uh, graphs can also be translated into parallel patterns. So what are the implications for the future uh, of uh, for future ML hardware, uh, given what we know about ML uh, uh, algorithms? So fundamentally, of course, since we want to, uh, to build very large models with very uh, high computational requirements, and we want to be able to serve these in real time, we need massive amounts of, of, of compute. And uh, since <coughs> you know, fundamentally compute is energy constrained, it, it, it's power constrained, it, it, this compute has to be energy efficient. We need to support very large terabyte size models to get state of the art accuracy. Sparsity is becoming an increasingly important aspect of large scale machine uh, learning training. We talked about the fact that we have a convergence of both training and inference on the same platform that would have a lot of advantages. And lastly, we talked about data flow graphs being the natural execution model for ML. And it, these data flow graphs can be translated into parallel patterns. So given these insights about algorithms, uh, now we can talk about what uh, data flow hardware and software can be developed to exploit uh, these insights. So the key idea of a data flow uh, uh, graph execution engine is one that could exploit parallel patterns. And uh, this is what we've developed in the form of a reconfigurable data flow architecture. And this data flow architecture is composed of uh, dedicated memory and compute that are optimized to execute parallel patterns. So you've got PMUs, which are patent memory units, and PCUs, which are patent compute units. Uh, uh, and these are organized in an array or a C of, 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 unit, of, of components, which are connected by a, uh, an, uh, an on-chip switch. So the first implementation of the reconfigurable data flow architecture is the Samba Nova Systems SN Cardinal SN10. And this is the first reconfigurable unit, uh, data flow unit. And it, uh, it was implemented in TSMC 7 nanometer. And it uh, taped out uh, the first half of 2019. It's got, you know, this, is, was, this was in fact the first uh, uh, AI chip to be implemented in 7 nanometer. It's got 640 patent compute units, which gives you over 300 uh, uh, teraflops of uh, BF16, and it's got 640 uh, uh, PMUs or, or patent memory units, which gives you over 300 megabytes of on-chip memory with, ha with access to that on-chip memory of over 150 terabytes per second on-chip. So let me give you a little more detail about how uh, the Sambanova uh, Cardinal SN10 uh, chip is designed. So it's designed at the high level as four uh, big uh, tiles. And each of these tiles has uh, the, the architecture uh, shown on the right, uh, which has patent memory units and patent compute units, and then, uh, uh, then connected to the interfaces of the chip are high-speed uh, interfaces to uh, DRAM and to uh, off-chip uh, interfaces to both other RDU chips and to the host system. So if you look inside of each uh, of one of these tiles uh, and you look at the, the uh, patent compute unit, what you will see is a reconfigurable pipeline uh, of, uh, uh, of components intended to exploit both SIMD parallelism and, uh, syst and, 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 and can also be organized as a systolic data path uh, which, of course, is, uh, is optimized for doing matrix multiply. 
And so what you can do uh, is, is, ex is, is exploit both pipeline parallelism at multiple levels and SIMD parallelism. And uh, you also have the capability of supporting a control flow with zero overhead loops. So you've got counters that, that provide this capability. And uh, you also have a tail unit, uh, which is optimized for doing uh, common functions that you see in ML algorithms like exponentiation and sigmoid. If you look at the PMU, the other key component of the, uh, uh, of the R RDU, uh, this is optimized for providing the storage uh, and uh, the, the memory system uh, on, on the SN10. And it, it's optimized both for bandwidth and for flexibility. So it's got a banked uh, array of, of SRAMs that supply, uh, which support uh, multiple streams of data that are uh, supplied to the, uh, uh, to the CMD PCUs. It's got uh, uh, address units, uh, which can be used to supply uh, a uh, arbitrary complex access streams, uh, including ones that are, are required for supporting sparsity. So sparsity was a key element uh, of, of, that was required in, in, future, in current and future ML algorithms and support for sparsity is supplied by uh, the address AL ALUs. There are also data alignment units uh, for providing high throughput tensor manipulation that can do transformations like transpose and also help uh, with sparsity. So if you think about how you compile for this data flow architecture, it uh, requires a fundamentally new way of thinking about compilation. So conventional compilation uh, for ML algorithms does things a kernel at a time. So you can think of the kernel uh, flow as shown on, on the left here as go, of going from one uh, kernel, so convolution, to the next kernel, uh, say pooling, and then uh, the intermediate data is staged through the off-chip HBM, right? So traditional compilers then uh, map operations to the processor one kernel at a time, and then the uh, kernel at a time uh, um, uh, optimization means that you only optimize a kernel uh, in isolation. Contrast that with what we are doing at Samba Novo with the Samba Flow uh, compiler stack, uh, and it is optimized for data flow comp uh, compilation, where you have fundamentally decomposed the compute from the, the memory access, so you've got that decoupled, and you optimize uh, both the compute uh, in, uh, separately from uh, the, 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 um, the, the memory access, right, such that you have a stream of data flowing from the patent memory units to the patent compute units. And the uh, data flow compiler then maps the whole graph, or as much of the graph as will fit at any one time, onto the uh, array of patent compute units and patent memory units, and uh, the, optimized, uh, the communication between them is optimized using the on-chip network. And so uh, in order to provide this, this, these capabilities, we've developed a new compiler based on MLIR as, as the uh, underlying uh, uh, infrastructure. And uh, this analyzes the whole model and comes up with a global optimization. So to see how this... Uh, uh, works, let's uh, contrast that, uh, the uh, computation uh, that uh, executes in a data flow fashion uh, with uh, th that uh, uh, which, uh, which we execute uh, on, on conventional uh, architectures one kernel at a time. So one kernel at, at a time means the intermediate data, as I said, you know, goes uh, on and off the, the chip and is staged through the uh, uh, off-chip HPM. And so if we look at the convolution graph as shown here, what we see is that the uh, different kernels, uh, the convolution conv1, the pool, in, and, 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 and conv2, communicate through the off-chip HBM. And so what that means, of course, is that you've got lots of high bandwidth communication off-chip, and you have the overhead of, uh, of of, of, initialize, of, of uh, starting a, a kernel, uh, one after each kernel, one after uh, the other. 
So contrast that with the way that we uh, do things in a data flow fashion. Uh, here, the uh, whole graph is mapped onto the chip at the same time, uh, such that data flows between the, the different kernels on chip. And uh, what we can also do is pipeline the uh, execution of the uh, graph such that we have multiple samples executing in parallel at the same time. And this naturally gives you two things. It gives you very low uh, off-chip bandwidth requirements, and so you've got efficient uh, uh, data movement on chip, and it gives you natural fusion of uh, computation, uh, of the computational kernels, and you also get uh, uh, the ability to overlap uh, the uh, uh, computation of multiple samples at the same time. And so the, the net result of it is that you can get very good performance at low batch sizes, right? And that you don't need expensive off-chip high bandwidth memories to support high uh, uh, computation rates. And uh, the uh, on-chip communication, of course, exploits data locality between the, the kernels uh, to get very efficient execution. And so the combination then of high com com compute capability, uh, 300 uh, teraflops plus, data flow efficiency, and the ability to uh, use off-chip DRAM, because you've, you've limited the, uh, the bandwidth requirements uh, that you need, uh, means that we can build a system that provides very, very high memory capacity and very high compute uh, efficiency uh, for terabyte size complex models. And uh, these uh, RDU chips then are connected together uh, uh, using uh, uh, PCI uh, interfaces for a high bandwidth uh, connection to provide a eight uh, uh, RDU uh, system, which fits in a quarter of a rack and has uh, support for 12 terabytes of memory. We can build larger systems so that, you know, you, that's a quarter rack. We build a half rack uh, with 16 RDUs and a, uh, a quarter rack, uh, say a full rack with, uh, with 24, uh, uh, with, uh, with 32 RDUs, uh, which uh, has 48 uh, terabytes of, of memory. And this is 38 times more than conventional GPU systems, which of course are limited to off-chip HBM. We could connect these uh, racks together with commodity uh, infinity band or, or Ethernet networks to build much larger scale-out systems that can provide uh, the ability to, to train and, uh, and, and uh, serve huge, huge models and uh, provide the capabilities that are required uh, for uh, modern ML environments. So one question that often comes up when I describe the reconfigurable data flow architecture is how flexible is this idea? How much headroom uh, do, you, do you have, and can you deal with dynamic models? And so uh, you know, at Stanford, we've been you know, continuing to innovate on this idea, and we've come up with the idea of you know, support for irregular data flow using this idea of uh, data flow threads, right? And so the idea is you'd like to be able to support Irregular algorithms, algorithms that have irregular data access, algorithms that have uh, irregular control, and uh, this is, is needed in future uh, graph neural networks. It's uh, uh, you know, being used in graph analytics. Uh, you know, it can support uh, data processing. And if you look at uh, conventional GPUs, which of course have spent a lot of time thinking about implementing threading uh, in various ways, you see that the threading capabilities of GPUs are limited in terms of sort of when you get uh, threads that, that, that to have irregular control flow, you have uh, what is called interwarp divergence, and uh, sometimes you've got uh, cases where between warps you, don't ha you have divergence. So the question is, can you be more efficient than, than, than uh, what is done with a GPU? And the key idea is to translate uh, irregular control flow to data flow. And so as you see in this picture, right, what you have is a set, you can think of, 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 of the threads as just some state, which can be represented as a set of records. And these records then can be laid out, uh, can be uh, manipulated 
uh, using the uh, resources of the reconfigurable data flow unit, the PCUs and the PMUs, such that instead of uh, doing uh, the, the thread records that, that, that diverge in terms of their control flow can be sent to different computational resources and, and they can be uh, computed on in parallel. And so you don't get the uh, sort of uh, constraint that you have with uh, conventional GPUs that predicate their execution and then so, and so on as efficient as, uh, as, uh, as, you, as, as you could have, right? So, uh, with divergent threads, you've got uh, predicated execution and, and, uh, and, and the lanes aren't fully utilized, but with, uh, uh, by converting a control flow to data flow, we're able to fully utilize the lanes of the, uh, of the fully utilize the, the, the lanes of, of the RDU. We can also dynamically generate uh, or, or fork threads uh, which enables you to fully use up all the uh, uh, resources, right? So you can reorder threads at runtime, and if you're doing algorithms that have pointer chasing, you can guarantee that you use up all the execution slots in your, uh, 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 in your compute resources. So and the key question, way that you translate uh, these... Uh, algorithms into data flow threads is to come up with a uh, algorithm that uh, uses the data flow resources to uh, implement certain uh, data structures. And this is a very simple case. is uh, a case of a list link uh, walk here where you, you uh, fetch the linked list from uh, the uh, uh, PMU labeled one, and then you decide whether uh, it matches some key and if not, you, uh, you go and, and you fetch the next link, and you do this in a data flow fashion. And so this is a very simple example, uh, but of course you can build much more complex data structures using hash tables and B trees and R trees. And then you can use these to implement uh, very, very efficient database applications, right? So uh, as an example, we have a whole array of database uh, uh, queries that we've implemented uh, uh, using data, uh, data flow threads, and we compare the performance of uh, these queries uh, against both CPUs and GPUs, and it's a factor of, uh, of 10x better than, than uh, GPUs because of, of the more efficient uh, uh, threading mechanisms provided by data flow threads, and it's a factor of 100 more uh, efficient uh, in terms of speed up compared to CPUs because you've got m much more computing capability. So. <clears throat> The net uh, result here is that reconfigurable data flow is not just for dense matrix or even sparse matrix compu computation. It can be used for much more flexible uh, uh, sorts of computation, such as irregular uh, uh, data structures like trees and hash tables. OK, so now let me talk about some of the applications uh, that we are uh, developing for, uh, or, or applications that are being developed for data flow computing. So as uh, one example, uh, it's being used uh, in neuroscience connectomics uh, and, and uh, traumatic brain injury research. And this is work that's being done at Argonne National Lab, and it's accelerating uh, the development of, of models that have been used for uh, treating or, or understanding traumatic brain injury. <clears throat> and so we see that, that, that the very efficient capabilities of the uh, data scale systems uh, are, are helping traumatic brain industry, I, 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 injuries. It's also being used, uh, at, at, at Lawrence Livermore is developing uh, drugs for COVID-19, uh, uh, and using it in COVID-19 research, and it's been used to uh, implement the uh, character-based Wasserstein autoencoder. So here the idea is that by using smaller batch sizes, you can develop more accurate models, and you can uh, you know, have those models converge more quickly. And key to this capability is the ability of the RDU systems to work very efficiently at small batch sizes. 
And so this uh, example is, uh, shows uh, this capability. Another capability that is really important in lots of scientific applications and lots of medical imaging pro uh, applications is being able to deal with very, very large models, uh, very, very large images, 40K by 40K uh, pixels. Today, if you want to deal with large images uh, on uh, GPU platforms, you either have to downsample the image, which means that the model uh, has to work with a blurred image, and so you get less accuracy, or you've got to segment or, or tile the image, which means, of course, you have issues uh, with features that cross the boundaries, and you have problems at the boundaries. Uh, uh, with the, the San Bonova uh, system, uh, what we do is we're able to handle the full resolution image, and so we can get state-of-the-art accuracy, and in this example, we locate the missing screw. Uh, but finding the missing screw is important in manufacturing, but much more important is detecting malignant cancer, right? And here you'd like to, again, be able to work with the full resolution image that comes from the medical image se imaging sensor. And so with the uh, data scale uh, system, we're able to get 100 times higher resolution, and we're able to detect malignant cancer much more effectively uh, using uh, the full resolution capability. Another example of how uh, improving resolution helps accuracy uh, is being developed at Argonne National Lab. And here the idea is to uh, do neutrino, neutrino physics image segmentation, right? So you're trying to understand, uh, you know, or trying to remove cosmic background uh, by using a, uh, a neural network-based model. And you, again, you'd like to work at full resolution because that gives you higher accuracy. So the higher accuracy curve is shown in the orange and compared to uh, uh, the lower accuracy uh, curve in the, in the green. And uh, that, the high accuracy curves from uh, working at full resolution as opposed to uh, the GPU working at a resolution which is a, is a fourth of uh, uh, what we are able to do with the RDU. Another example of the benefits of uh, the ability to operate very efficiently at low batch size is shown uh, with this uh, deep learning recommendation model. And here the idea is to do very high uh, throughput inference or very low latency, uh, uh, at very low latency. And, and here we are able to get a 20 uh, times improvement uh, in throughput at batch one, uh, uh, bat, uh, batch one. And uh, the, the, you know, this also translates to the same improvement in latency. And this enables you to do, as I said, both batch one inference and large batch training on the same platform. In terms of training very, very large models, uh, the big benefit of being able to have terabytes of memory uh, connected directly to your compute capability is to be able to simply develop trillion uh, parameter large natural language processing models, right? You don't have to go through the uh, uh, pain of uh, uh, connecting together thousands of, of GPUs and think of figuring out how to uh, orchestrate the model parallelism and uh, design the system such that you can scale. It uh, is much uh, easier to download your model from, uh, from Hugging Face and run it directly with high accuracy in a very straightforward way, given the large amounts of memory that can be directly connected to the, uh, to the machine. So, but not everybody has the capability to develop models uh, using PyTorch and TensorFlow. Some uh, organizations uh, you know, have data, but they don't have the, uh, the talent uh, in the AI and data, uh, data science space to develop models and, and make use of that data. And so this is the why, why we at uh, Samano have developed Dataflow as a service. The idea is to provide uh, models, uh, such as uh, natural language processing models, such as recommender models, uh, uh, and uh, high uh, resolution uh, image models uh, in a easy to use uh, manner that doesn't require that you have any expertise in machine learning.
And uh, so the idea then is to provide these capabilities to organizations that need this, this, this capability and want to integrate AI to improve their business or uh, transform uh, uh, the way that, that, that their organization is working. Okay? And so <clears throat> integrating these things in, in, into, into the environment is, uh, is really important. And uh, you know, as an example, uh, this is, I'm you know, proud to announce you know, the first uh, you know, customer, commercial customer at scale for the uh, data flow as a service uh, offering, product offering, and it's uh, by o OTP Bank, which is a bank based in Hungary, and they selected uh, Sam Bonova uh, for enterprise scale AI supercomputing, right? And so the OTP Bank is this leading financial uh, group in Europe, <clears throat> And what they want is a uh, solution that provides very high capability and uh, or the, the uh, capability to do natural language processing uh, for a number of banking uses. And uh, so they've got large models. And so using our GPT uh, uh, capability, which uh, scales up to 175 billion parameters, we are providing uh, OTP Bank uh, with uh, this data flow as a service and the first uh, uses are, the, are for you know, sentiment analysis, for document classification, and for named entity uh, recognition. And so this is a key uh, AI supercomputer capability uh, and shows that, that the Sam Bonova RDU systems uh, work at, at scale and are being used uh, by organizations uh, all over the world. So you want to learn more about the Sam Bonova system, I encourage you uh, Sam Bonova Systems, I encourage you to visit us at booth uh, 1127 and let the data flow. And if you want details about uh, uh, you know, some of the architecture issues that I haven't had a chance to talk about, I encourage you to download the white paper, you know, visit the product web pages, and also uh, talk to us about uh, our partnership program called Elevate. So with that, uh, let me end and ask uh, if there are any questions. Thank you. All right, let's thank our speaker. Okay, so I'm going to go through a few questions from, uh, from Slido. We have, about, we have a few minutes for questions. So the first question is, can you comment on the power consumption of the rack system and the relative advantage uh, in energy efficiency? So the power uh, constraints are, are similar to, to what you see with, with the GPU, mm -hmm. right? And so in terms of, you know, we're going to use the, the full power envelope that, that, that you get uh, in a, a data center environment. And so the question is sort of how efficiently uh, you're using that power. But do, do you get more power density with the data flow architecture in one rack than you would with a similar GPU system? Uh, no, because you're fu fundamentally limited by your power, the ability to get the heat out, right? Okay. And so if you, if you increase the density of, of power, uh, then you'd have to get, get the heat out, right? So. Okay. Um, the second question is, uh, with a new architecture, do you see opportunities for hardware support to help with privacy in machine learning? Uh, can no, you repeat please. that, please? Do you, with a new architecture, do you see opportunities for hardware support to help with privacy in machine learning? Help with privacy? Yeah. Uh, so yes, yes. In fact, it turns out that a lot of the privacy-preserving algorithms that, that one wants to develop use huge amounts of memory. Right? So they need terabytes of memory. There's this uh, idea, in fact, that I was just talking to a researcher at Stanford that has this uh, idea for sort of using homographic uh, crypto uh, to, to do uh, uh, algorithms that are privacy preserving. The big problem is that they don't work well on today's GPUs because GPUs don't have enough memory to, to support them. And so if you could provide a lot more memory, then potentially you could do private training, right? So that means I could get your medical data, I could uh, cryptographically encode it, and I could do training on that data and not reveal any of your um, personal information. Great. Um, the next question is, could commodity chips also take advantage of data flow efficiency for small batch sizes? Isn't that more of an advantage um, sort of on the desktop or in commodity systems than for huge ML workloads? So if you have small batch sizes, why a giant rack? 
Pot? If, if you're good at giant, uh, small batch sizes, why, why just a giant rack for, for uh, Salmonova? Why just a giant? Well, I mean, the, the initial focus is on the data center, but there's nothing to say that you couldn't take a portion of the, uh, the, the RDU and use it to support the edge uh, sorts of uh, applications, mm -hmm. uh, or even you know, you can take one chip and potentially put it in, in a desktop, but that's not the initial focus of, of the first products. Okay, thanks. I think with that, um, that's all the questions that we have time for, so let's thank our speaker once again. Thank you, Kumei.